Okay, so now my title slide says uh, chapters 12 and 13. We're actually not covering all of both of those chapters because we, we got started in chapter 12 uh, last week, uh, and uh, we're not going to go all the way to the end of chapter 13 this week, um, but, but should get through the first 20 verses of that chapter. Uh, we're picking up actually in verse 9. Uh, we, last week we talked about Mary's anointing uh, of Jesus' feet, and that took place in Bethany. Uh, so I wanted to, to share uh, a map just to, to get an idea. Uh, we have Jerusalem over here on, on the left and then Bethany to the right uh, of that map. And you can see the scale there. Bethany just about a mile outside the walls of Jerusalem. Um, and interestingly, the, in Arabic, the name uh, of the, the city is actually, uh, well, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it essentially means the place of Lazarus. Uh, so they, they're aware, aware of the, the story of Lazarus as well. Uh, and if you recall, the disciples had been worried about going to Judea at all back in chapter 11 uh, because of the, the, the attempt to stone Jesus that had happened on their, his previous visit there. Again, that was recorded in chapter 10. And, and, and that worry was before the raising of, of Lazarus. And, and that really created an additional stir with all of the news of that event uh, and, and a lot more people starting to believe in Jesus and or just wanting to find out more, drawing a lot more attention to him and his work. And uh, the uh, prompted a really a more definite plot uh, against Jesus, as opposed to what had been before, been before almost more of a spontaneous attempt to, to stone him. Um, and in chapter 11, where, where the discussion of, of this plan to, to arrest and, and kill Jesus, it, it's interesting there. It, it seems almost to be based on a the idea, oh, no, what if he is the Messiah? As in, uh, that's going to create conflict with Rome, and then Rome will take away the bit of position, the bit of power that the chief priests and, and the Pharisees have uh, there in Judea. Um and so it's almost that they have a lack of faith that, that someone who, who might actually be the Messiah would be able to prevail against Rome. Or maybe there even a fear that even if, the, if a Messiah does prevail against Rome, he's going to install his own followers in our place. Either way, we're going to lose our position. And it seems to be more of their concern. It has to do with their position, their influence, and their power rather than uh, God and, and following his will. But because of that plot, uh, in John 11, verse 54, we read, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Um, so then six days before Passover, and everyone, and remember with Passover, you've got a lot of people coming to Jerusalem, and everyone is wondering whether or not Jesus is going to show up in Jerusalem for Passover. But six days before, they returned to Bethany, and we have the, the incident that we talked about last week with the, the anointing of Jesus' feet by Mary at the beginning of that chapter. And, and after that, people find out that Jesus is back in the area, that, that they know that he's in Bethany. So we're going to pick up in verse 9 of chapter 12. So when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So Lazarus himself was evidence that should lead and was leading people to believe in Jesus. Uh, but the chief priests and other leaders would not consider what the evidence actually meant. They, they would not acknowledge the increasingly apparent truth about Jesus. Instead, again, they were looking only to how it was affecting and how it might potentially further affect their position of power, their position uh, of influence. Uh, so... The same passage here, but 
emphasizing this this phrase here that on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And I, I thought that phrase was interesting, that people are departing. They're moving away from the chief priest's influence, slipping out of their grasp. Uh, and there may also be a little, uh, a bit of a literal aspect of this as well. Uh, I, I mentioned that, you know, with the Passover, people are coming to Jerusalem. Uh, from one source I saw, they believe the population of Jerusalem at this time would have been around between 20 and 30,000 people. But at the time of Passover, that population would swell to 150 or 180,000. That's a, a major shift uh, there in the number of people that are, are, are present. And so that, that normal increase of population, uh, you've got people who have gone out uh, from Jerusalem out to Bethany, uh, to this, this suburb, uh, and the buzz and focus that would have been uh, uh, occurring around Passover in Jerusalem was shifting away from the sphere of the chief priests. Uh, and, and it makes me wonder, too, again, with, with the attitude of the chief priests, if, if to some degree they didn't see uh, Passover as being uh, their event rather than what Passover was supposed to be. Um, back in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, he said, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. And then in, in Exodus 13, verse 14, And when in time to come your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Uh, and, and again, it has me think that, again, that's not the focus that the chief priests have on it, but rather it's an opportunity for them to, to, be, to be seen and an opportunity for them to, to, to exercise their influence over uh, the, uh, the population that's come here to Jerusalem. And here you see that the people are going away from the traditions and the influence of men like the chief priests to follow who we'll eventually learn is, is the true Passover lamb, the son of God, who's going to free them from slavery to sin. Um, so a, again, it, it's interesting following that, the attitude um, uh, of the chief priests and Pharisees and other leaders in, in Jewish society, uh, so focused on what their own personal interests in are, are rather again than what the will of God is. Picking up uh, in verse 12, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Um, you know, it almost with with the information that we 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 mentioned earlier about the the number of people and how much the population of Jerusalem swells at Passover, the the phrase "large crowd" that had come to the feast almost comes across as an understatement. Um. Uh, and so, but uh, I the, this. What they go through here with uh, the branches of the palm trees, I, I did come across one reference that indicated that the use of palm branches like this uh, on the road coming into Jerusalem was actually something that would sometimes done more generally to welcome people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. Uh, and, and the palm itself did have some sort of uh, status as a, as a national symbol, uh, and it had uh, probably since the time of the Maccabees uh, in the intertestamental period. But th this particular welcome takes on m some more significance than just the, the general welcoming of people to Jerusalem for, for the feast. Uh, Hosanna is a, is a call out to, to save or rescue or deliver and, and a recognition of, of someone who has uh, done that or is expected to do so. Uh, now, what they cry out isn't exactly like, but very similar to uh, what we read in Psalm 118. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we bless you from the house of the Lord. The, this psalm would have actually been fresh on the minds of the people. It was, it was a, a psalm that was often recited uh, at, at the time of the Passover. Um, and of course, this, uh, they are identifying here a, a, as king. Uh, and, and that's a major thing. That's exactly the sort of thing that the chief priests and the Pharisees want to avoid. And he hasn't been mentioned here in our text, but Herod couldn't be too happy about it either. Uh, to have uh, someone else uh, recognized or, 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 or proclaimed as king. Uh, this continues with, with this entry in verses 14 and 15. And it says, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Again, seeing Jesus arrive this way, uh, combined with the news about Lazarus and other signs uh, circulating, uh, it's going to have people remembering passages uh, like this, it's going to have them reaching conclusions about Jesus's identity as the Messiah. And, and it's the words they said about Jesus were correct, but their understanding of those words was skewed. And that's true even among the disciples and the apostles. Uh, in, in verse 16, we read, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Now, John, of course, the writer of this is, is one of those included. He, that even he, who, who uh, of all the apostles was closest to Jesus, didn't get it. He didn't understand everything that was happening and what was going on and really even what the Messiah is supposed to be, what, what Christ is supposed to be, uh, and uh, as they see all of this unfold. Uh, so there's actually a, a lot of confusion, and, and, there, and people are going to get more confused as we continue uh, reading here in John. Uh, verses 17 through 19. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done his sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that they are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. All of our plotting is coming to nothing. And, and it's interesting. Uh, again, the buzz is just continues to grow. Uh, and the Pharisees here probably believe that they're exaggerating, but again, this news actually is spreading. Um, verses 20 through 22, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So these Greeks, they would have been God-fearing Gentiles, not necessarily Greek, uh, but, but Greek-speaking. Um, it would have been normal to refer to any non-Jew as, as Greek, as sort of a blanket covering. And Greek is sort of the, 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 the common language throughout uh, this portion of the Roman Empire. Um, the uh, Philip himself ha has a Greek name, and uh, Bethsaida, where he is from, is close to predominantly Gentile cities. It's possible that, that maybe these men already knew Philip and saw him as, a, as an opportunity to, to, to get the, an introduction to Jesus. But I mentioned, you know, when the, the Pharisees said that, look, the world has gone after him, that they, they probably thought they were exaggerating. But we see here that people from outside, uh, just uh, the, the Jews who are, are, are already getting attention, uh, having, he's drawing attention from them as well, his work and his word. Um, verses 23 through 26. 
And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So all of this excitement around Jesus, this speculation, even uh, up to a declaration that he is the Messiah, that he is the king, and Jesus starts talking about dying. <laughs> he clearly indicates here that, that the Messiahship isn't about earthly rule, which is what everyone is expecting. Even the apostles have that kind of expectation about Jesus. Um, their focus, uh, again, is on this world, on, on merely earthly things. It's, a, it's an incorrect focus, and it's a focus that needs to change. Jesus continues, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Father, save me from this hour, but, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. <laughs> it's interesting here, uh, the, the voice, or some, some think it was thunder, some think, again, an angel sp speaking to Jesus. But they seem to have a harder time accepting a voice from heaven than they did the idea of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Um, and I'm almost not sure what to make of that, 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 that seemed easier to grasp and, and, and believe and hold on to than what is this the, than the voice um but continuing on jesus says now is the judgment of this world now will the ruler of this world be cast out and i when i am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die so the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And so it's particularly apt for, for this message to come uh, in conjunction with the interest that's been expect, uh, expressed by, by the Greeks, by these Gentiles. Uh, because, again, the prevailing view, the prevailing expectation uh, 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 of the, the Jewish people of the Messianic kingdom was of an earthly Jews-on-top kingdom uh, that, that, again, might spread beyond just the Jews, but they would be at, at, the, at the top of, of, of that kingdom. And instead, Jesus points to a spiritual kingdom that's for all people. Um, He's going to draw all people to himself and because the victory that Jesus is going to achieve isn't over a merely earthly power like Rome, but instead over Satan. And that victory is going to come via his death. Um, where it says here, and I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, this is the third uh lifted up statement uh, of the book of John. Uh, the first time Jesus talks about being lifted up is in chapter 3, verse 14, and he relates that to Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness when uh, the, the people were, were uh, suffering from these poisonous snakes, and a, an image of a snake is created and put on a pole and lifted up, and people have to look to that image in order to be saved from Again, the poison of, of these snakes. Um, and, and again, that's in Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. He talks about, again, 
that that he is going to be lifted up. The second time he makes, uh, again, using that phrase is in chapter eight, and he's speaking to a crowd at the temple there, and that's part of a longer dialogue. And interesting, that that dialogue actually concluded with people picking up stones to stone him because of the claims he was making about who he was and his position in relation to God, him claiming deity for himself. Uh, and then we have this the occurrence here again in chapter 12, verse 32. And so the crowd actually understands that when Jesus talks about being lifted up, that this refers to death. And they can't quite equate their idea uh, of what the Messiah is supposed to be with Jesus' indication that he's going to die. And, and again, this, this is the same struggle that the apostles have. Uh, they can't make that 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 come together in their minds. It's not what they expect, uh, and it's because again they're they're thinking in worldly terms, and they can't see anything that ends with Jesus dying as being a victory, uh, despite the explanation that Jesus gives that through this he's going to draw all people to him. So they're essentially asking if you're going to die, you can't be the Messiah, you can't be the Christ. Uh, are you saying the Son of Man and the Messiah are two different people, or, or if you're not the Messiah, who is? Uh, so again, there's all been all of this excitement about Jesus around Jesus. He, this, you hear about the man Jesus raised from the dead, and, and here he is. He's coming to the Passover. Is this? A, are, are we going to see Rome defeated and 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 a, a, a new dawn of, of G, Jewish uh, dominance, a, a rebirth of the nation of Israel, and Jesus starts talking about, again, uh, dying, and, and, and they're, they're confused. They're, it's, it's kind of a, a, a change in direction from everything that they were thinking. And again, so in verses 35 and 36, so Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Now, this didn't alleviate the confusion. Uh, that they, 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 they still have that confusion. And he goes away. He let them think about it. Uh, to really think about things jesus has said and taught uh and and really that's kind of the the sad thing is jesus has done a a, a lot of, of teaching and over the past three years and, and still people's focus instead of on that things that he has actually said has been more on the signs and the power in them and their expectations of where that power could or might go instead of what God wants to achieve uh, with that power. Because God has something that's actually much bigger than just, again, conquering Rome in, in mind. Uh, he has what they actually really need in mind and the victory over Satan and, and freeing them from, from slavery to sin. Uh, but again, there's a, a lack of understanding on it because, again, their thoughts hadn't been in that mode and in that direction. Though he had done so many signs before him, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again in Isaiah, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the even of the authorities believed in him, but fear for fear of the Pharisees they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So it's interesting. Through this passage, we have 
unbelief and a lack of understanding and belief, but not quite enough of it. Uh, and, and this this mixture and, and a sort of a back and forth we see as people try to gra grasp exactly who Jesus is and what he is going to do, how he is, is he going to change things for us? Is he going to change things for us? Um, and, and so this is sort of mixture of unbelief and lack of understanding. And, and again, like I said, belief, but not quite enough of it. I have to wonder, is, is our belief ever like that? Is our belief ever like that of the, those authorities that it says here believed in him but didn't confess him? Uh, are we ever so protective of our social standing, our place in our community, our, our, our workplace, that we don't mention Christ? Uh, that we're afraid to speak out and confess his name before men? Um, again, I think that's something that we have to, to, to keep in mind and, and, and guard us. And it's something that Ron has, has multiple times as we've gone through the, the, this quarter talked about these sort of belief and then there's belief. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a belief that's, that's in some ways isn't more than just an, an intellectual acknowledgement. And then there's a belief that actually changes the way you behave, changes the way you act. Uh, it, it, it's because I believe I, I'm actually going to do something about it. Yes. I mean, everyone at this time, except for Jesus, has some amount of confusion. I mean, even the people that are following him mm -hmm. are just not connecting all the dots. The only difference is whether you stay with Jesus through the confusion or not. Yeah, and and, and <clears throat> even those closest to him aren't going to completely stay with him <laughs> through it. The, the, they're going to uh, be abandoning him. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and I think, uh, is it Christopher or maybe it's Susan? Oh, yes, you got it. Um, I was just going to say in the, in the comment about, um, you know, us trying to look for ways at work and stuff for, um, to profess Christ, it becomes a little challenging because um, there is that fine line that gets you a trip to HR. <laughs> so um, what I found, though, it's, it's a great pool of people to look for those opportunities and if they're if they talk about it first, sometimes we can think of that gives us an open door. If somebody uses, you know, a lot of times people can use the word Jesus in a joking manner, and you can sort of take a spin off of that because they mentioned his name first or even God's name. And although they may be using it in an ignorant blasphemy way, but they don't realize that it still allows you to have that door opened to have that conversation. Um, so, so being a little crafty in your way of looking for those opportunities, because um, otherwise it could be intimidating to even mention it in a work due to the fear of an HR conversation. Yeah, Absolutely. It, it is interesting because we have uh, next month, we have a, a, a mandatory workshop on diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect. Okay. Yes. Uh, our preparation, four hours workshop. And I, I get the feeling that diversity implies, uh, applies to everything except uh, New Testament Christianity. <laughs> Jay, I, it's funny you mention that. I agree with you because the company I'm at is doing a lot of, you know, catalysts for change and all these things. And I'm like, but um, I think it comes to whenever it's a topic where somebody can be judged to a condemnation type of ending is where I think the line, they, 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 they don't allow that to be talked about. Okay. So um, I think that's what I found is sort of a common thing because I was just like, we should all be, you know, atheists should be able to go and talk about it, right? If we look yeah. at it from that, devil worshipers should be able to come and have a platform and so should Christians, right? But there's that line that somehow is the unspoken line that we're like, we're not really total catalyst for change or for diversity because we're not allowing that full platform, right? Well, I'm, I'm thinking if it comes up, you know, about, you know, are you open to other groups, et cetera, et cetera, I'll probably stick my neck out. But if they ask me directly, I'm going to say, I've always tried to treat everyone 
the way they would treat me, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verse 12. Or, or yeah, Matthew 7, verse 12. If they want to, and they'll probably jump on me about it. But if they do, I'm going to say, hey, what about diversity? It's, and it's at least that's a positive way of saying it. So I, I, I'm regretting this workshop. So that's a good strategy, Jay. I would say, and I don't know how, you know, the company you work at, I'm just trying to think from somebody that's that's not a Christian that if you if you reference a book that I don't even know about, you're gonna lose me. So right. just if that the that's what Jesus said, I'll understand Jesus. But if you start quoting like where it's at, I might just for helpful hint disregard you. But um, another thing you might look for because this has been allowed in my company is to start a Bible study. Like they have a a a actually company Bible study. Granted, it's only allowed to touch upon certain level at a certain level so that it's applicable to a lot of the mass of the quote unquote religious Christian religious groups. But that may be an opportunity for you to ask about it and see if maybe you could start one there. You'd be surprised what a company will support. Good point. And it's interesting. Um all, there seems to in the world around us to be a, a, a again there, there's a push for for being uh, accepting uh, uh, of everyone to let everyone have their 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 own belief to to do that but there's a, a almost an animosity about the idea of of proselytizing about recruiting anyone to 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 the same beliefs we're supposed to all just believe whatever we believe and be quiet about it apparently um but actually but you know we wouldn't really believe what we believe if we are completely quiet about it because part of what we what we believe in what jesus has told us is that we are to proclaim um so if we say that we we believe jesus is christ that he is our savior and yet we're not willing to do what he says do we really believe um and, um, and, and that's, I think, the challenge that we've got to make to ourselves. And, and David, just something that just jogged my memory. So thinking about this whole conversation, like with what a work environment, part of that diversity, Jay, too, is about inclusion. So maybe the angle we could go at this at work is saying, hey, our business is putting effort in to diversity and all of that. Let, you know, is an, an opportunity to tell how everybody can be included in this you know what I mean? Like you could go sure. from that angle and say it is an inclusive topic. Mm -hmm. It has criteria. You know, that's the second part. Right. But it is he, he wants to include everyone. He doesn't want yeah. anyone to perish. Right. So I, I do get the impre the impression from the our company is pretty much bought into the prevailing thoughts, of the culture now that there are certain groups that we want to include in diversity, but others we do not, you know, because they're the, I don't know, the white people are the racists and the, you know, all, all that Christianity is oppressive, et cetera, et cetera. So, but we'll see what they, I mean, I, I may mean, not be as bad as I think it's going to be, but. And, you know, sometimes we see attitudes like that. Uh, and I think sometimes because we have seen attitudes like that, we become ready to see them. And something that sounds similar uh, and, and and it's not necessarily where where people are always coming from um and, and a lot of what we see with with that is sort of a, a necessary correction <laughs> that there's a you know there are things that we've ignored and pushed aside and so we're we're, we're trying to, to to give attention to that now um and it feels like other things being swept aside and but that's not, not always the 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 intent and, and even though sometimes it feels like that uh it, it and it, again that when we do have opportunities uh you know, we shouldn't be surprised if if people aren't confused by the message of christ um even people who have uh, some, you know, background where they've had some exposure to Christianity and, and to the Bible may be confused about the message when it's declared uh, clearly, 
uh, and simply because it doesn't measure up to what their idea of it uh, has been, that they've got a different picture of what Christianity is, of who Jesus is. Uh, and so there may be confusion when we represent the truth about Jesus, um, just like there was confusion here, again, from from across the spectrum, uh, you know, again, all the way up through the apostles, confused about what's coming next and, and what is supposed to happen. Um, One thing I was thinking was, uh, uh, and, and I'm probably slowing us down too much, but uh, uh, when they talk about the, there's one idea of the Messiah is going to be powerful. He's going to come and he's going to free them from oppression and everything. But we often talk about Isaiah 53, where the Messiah is a suffering servant and all this stuff was done to him. And, you know, he, he, he was, you know, he didn't have any, so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't able to defend himself or whatever. And I think they understood that too, but that doesn't seem to come out in any of this. There, there's, there's all this idea. Of course, maybe they're just, maybe they're just hopeful more than anything else. They just wanted somebody to come and, uh, you know, uh, save their nation. Uh, I think you know, yeah, because people were aware of it. They 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 knew they saw those passages, but passages that don't line up with the things that you they had a strong feeling for, a strong desire for. You know, you kind of you don't dwell on that as much, um, and so it's easy to 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 make the expectations more in line with what you think ought to happen, instead of. Well, what does God really say ought to happen? And, and, and really, you kind of see that with a, even when you talk about the Pharisees and their whole attitude toward the law, where they had gotten so involved in their idea of, of their teaching about the law that they'd lost focus on the law. <laughs> Uh, and, and lose sight of what God really said because they're so focused on their 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 teaching. Um, this, as usual, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. So people can look back at the cross and say, "Well, Jesus suffered this, this, and this." Well, on the other hand, there's people even today that <laughs> there are a lot of premillennialists that say that. Well, Jesus' attempt to set up the kingdom failed at that time, and the king was supposed to be on the earth, so it hasn't happened. So he's going, he had to re he, He's going to come back later because he hasn't come back yet after all this time. But the the idea that they were expecting didn't happen. On the other hand, the Isaiah fifty three part was much easier to see. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, Jesus. Uh, we actually had these next several verses. We have some more. Uh, explanation from Jesus. Uh, it's interesting, though. We before I read verses forty-four and following. Um, we back in verse thirty-six, it said that Jesus had departed and hid himself, a and then verses thirty-seven through forty are sort of John's explanation of the the responses of unbelief and incomplete belief. And so no indication is given uh, as to when Jesus said the contents of verses 44 and following. Um, and, and, and so we're not sure, sure uh, exactly when this was said, but it could be seen as sort of a summary of Jesus's message throughout his ministry. So I'll, I'll go ahead and read. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So again, the, the idea of this as sort of a summary of, of Jesus' message throughout his ministry. That people needed a clearer picture of God that wasn't shrouded by the traditions of men, that wasn't clouded over by their own earthly desires. 
their own earthly desires for, for power, for, for recognition, for standing in the world around them. Uh, and, and Jesus is that clear picture. He is that light, the only way to eternal life. Um, here is God giving the, us that clear picture of who he is. And yet, because of all these traditions and other ideas and, and desires, people still aren't seeing it. Um, they the, aren't seeing Jesus for who he is. Notice, too, it, it says here, and Jesus cried out. <laughs> uh, Jesus made sure his message was heard, whether it was understood or not. And that, that is what God does. God wants to be heard and understood. He reveals himself to us. Now, the ability to hear and understand that message is dependent on the condition of the heart of the one who hears. And, and that condition can change. Uh, 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 a heart that's not ready to accept it today may be more open in the future. And, and we we don't uh, and it, but it needs to hear the message, uh, and uh, God makes sure that that message is heard. Uh, he he his plan was was to send Jesus to to show himself through Christ, uh, so that we could know who he is. Um. So we're going to go ahead and continue into chapter 13. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I do want to try to get a, a bit of chapter 13 covered. Uh, now, before the feast uh, of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, this is the last night that Jesus has with his apostles, and Jesus knows it. Uh, and, and notice his love for them wasn't lessened by their lack of understanding. You know, you think that would be very frustrating that even these guys who've, who've been with me and, and right next to me through all of this still don't quite get it, uh, that, that, that imperfection of their belief. And he, his, his love isn't lessened even by the fact that they would all abandon him that very night. Uh, during supper, when, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, I, I believe we've mentioned before that this task of, of washing feet was a task for the lowliest of servants, uh, and it's a task that the apostles had simply left undone. It normally would have been done before this time when, as they were all coming in. But look at the lead-in in this verse. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that's when Jesus washes their feet. Jesus knew who he was. He knew where he belonged. At the, the, the right hand of God, he knew the glory that's due to him, and he didn't consider that to be a barrier to performing this lowly task. Um, that's his attitude uh, of humility that he's, he's teaching to the apostles uh, here. Uh, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, I kind of wonder here how many sets of feet Jesus went through before he got to Peter. <laughs> uh, but, but of course, it's Peter is the one who opens his mouth. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and with Jesus's response, really, when Jesus says, 
um, what I'm doing you don't understand, but after you understand, really the only wise response there would be to not say anything else. <laughs> Uh, but of course, Peter opens his mouth again, and I, I, I actually couldn't help but wonder here. If imagine you're one of the apostles and your feet have already been washed by Jesus, and then Peter goes through this, uh, um, I could imagine that you might resent Peter a little bit. Um, and, and Peter may as well have have blurted out, "I want my share and more," <laughs> when Jesus says, "If I don't wash you, you have no share with me." Um, and so again, you see again that 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 struggle that that failure to completely catch on to what Jesus is trying to teach them. Uh, continuing, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, "Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am." If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus, if, I, if I'm not too good for this, you're not too good for this. Wash each other's feet, serve each other in, in humility instead of jockeying for position, instead of standing on pride. Jesus continues, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Um, so Jesus wasn't surprised by his betrayal, and now the, the apostles will know that Jesus wasn't surprised uh, because he go, makes a point of telling them beforehand. Um, also, what Jesus says here of the relationship between him and his messengers echoes what he has previously said about his relationship with the Father. And again, that's something that that, that the apostles are going to come into a, a fuller understanding of later. But just exactly the greatness of what Jesus is doing for them and, and the role for the, that he has for them in his kingdom. Um, of Again, the, this this closeness, this drawing to God that's possible through him, uh, which really was some, should occasionally just boggle us <laughs> because of how incredible and amazing that is, that that's what God desires uh, is, is, a, is a, to really to have us close to him. Um. And we're going to wrap it up there for this week.